All right, so we're we're in this series of um, uh, First John, and we're now up to chapter three, and we're going to conclude in verses thirteen through twenty-four, which will finish out this chapter. And as I was going through uh, this particular part, I was struck by the redundancy in which John speaks. He's constantly repeating the same thing, kind of, saying it in a little bit of a different way, but over and over and over again about this idea about brotherly love. And I'm thinking to myself, geez, how many different ways can I say this in this series? Because it's just been the same thing kind of over and over again. I've been just trying to come at it from different angles. Well, when I got done translating this whole series, uh, or for today's portion anyway, I came away with the idea that in essence what John is really talking about is a threshold blood covenant command. A threshold blood covenant command. And it's something that in the body of Messiah we do not investigate very often. And uh, if, if ever at all, really. And so what I got out of this is, is that this threshold blood covenant that we're in is many times construed by us as individuals as this blood covenant we have with Yeshua. And although that may be very true, it really goes beyond that because once we have that covenant, uh, blood covenant we have with Yeshua, once we have that, we are then compelled to ratify that covenant with each and every one of us as individuals. Ombre to ombre, man to man. And that's where it gets down and dirty because it's really easy to worship an Elohim that you really don't see. But when it comes to honoring that same threshold blood covenant with our brother or our sister, that's where it starts to get tough. And that's where it gets complicated because many times we have cultural differences, we have different social backgrounds, and we have different values and beliefs, not only about what the world has taught us and what we bring into the body of Messiah, but also what happens is in a religious context, we're all at different levels of understanding of what scripture compels us to do or not do. It's been said that we have 613 commandments in the Torah that we're supposed to keep, but quite frankly, there are some elements of that that we just simply can't keep. We don't have a temple, so we can't do temple sacrifices. So some of us like to battle over some of these things and fight with one another and when we shouldn't be fighting with one another. And what we gotta do is we gotta come to a level of maturity in the body of Messiah where we can respect one another and still love one another and not have these kinds of disagreements that lead to battling conflicts and splits within the fellowship. And so I'm gonna get into a few different aspects of this blood threshold covenant uh, as I go through this. So let's go ahead and let's get started. So picking up in verse 13, leaving off at uh, verse 12 last time, do not marvel with admiration, my brethren, if the world hates and detests to the point of persecuting of you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in a state of expectancy of death. Now, when I read that, I thought to myself, that's a tall, tall order right there. Because right there, what we're going to have to do as individuals, we're going to have to stop and ask ourselves some very serious questions and be honest with ourselves about how do I define that within myself? Because I've met a lot of people in the body of Messiah that quite frankly, at face value, the way they come off, I don't much care for them. And I know there are many that don't much like what, what they see with me. But is, is that enough to have this this idea that somehow I should not accept that person. Yahweh has created so many different cultures on the earth and many different expressions of faith. Um, I'm talking about within this faith, many different expressions of worship. So can we say that any one of us has the license on this and somebody else does not and so you don't particularly like the way that person is expressing themselves and so you want to shun them and put them off in a corner. And we ought not do that. We've got to find some way to get to a point where we can respect one another and love one another the way John is talking in these texts. So let's move on. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, in essence, when I read this, I thought to myself, my gosh, 
when I don't like a particular brother or sister, but Yahweh is living in them, in essence, what I'm doing is I am killing the image of Yahweh in that person. And I thought to myself, I never really quite looked at it that way before. Because if Yahweh is living in me and he's living in you, and I treat you with a lack of love and respect, then what I am doing is I am murdering you. I am killing you. And when I do that, I'm destroying your temple, which is where Yahweh resides inside of you. In essence, what I am doing is I'm destroying the image of Yahweh. Let's read. Whoever sheds man blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image, Tishlem, representative figure of Yahweh, he made man. So what he's saying by the letter of the law here is that we don't have a right to destroy another human being. But what I'm trying to do is go to the spiritual intent of it because you may not destroy this other person that you don't really care for very much. But in essence, with your words or even with your heart, you may be destroying the image of that person that Yahweh is trying to develop inside of that person. And so we need to look at it at a little bit more of a deeper level. And this is not just within the body of Messiah, but this is in the world altogether. And I think I've talked about it before, that if we have an exclusionary kind of club mentality where nobody else is allowed in, then we're going to view the world as completely an enemy and not to be touched, not to be associated with. And there is an element of that. I don't want to dispel that. But what I'm saying is what that does, that mentality does, is it compels us to view those people as outsiders, as not worthy of a calling in Yeshua. And so then Yahweh has to use somebody else who has a more open mind to use to proselytize that person and nurture them over to this side. So we have to be very careful inside by examining our hearts to see whether or not we are venting any kind of ill will or malice towards another person where that should not be going on. If we're going to come to the full stature and maturity of Yeshua HaMashiach, we're going to have to start asking ourselves some hard questions. I was just talking to a brother over here and he told me he was thrown out of a messianic congregation because he proclaimed the name of Yahweh. Well, I say Baruch Hashem. That's a badge of honor. I said, welcome to the club. I've been thrown out too. Okay? So the thing is, is that I don't hold any ill will towards them. They have limiting beliefs about who Yahweh is and whether or not you should use the name. I still love them. I pray for them. But I can't hang out there because I'm not going to reject Yahweh and using his name because you tell me to. So we do have lines in the sand that we do have to draw with other people in the body of Messiah. And we just have to realize they're not at the point, at least in that area of their life, where they understand what it is we actually believe. And so you got to give people time and space to be able to grow and mature in the body of Messiah, no matter how long they've been in it. In John chapter 3, verse 36, um, the wrath of Yahweh avenges to blood covenants. You see, when we're in blood threshold covenant with each other, and we really understand the dynamics of that, when the other person is doing something that's not right, and they won't correct themselves, you have a legal right to go before Yahweh and hold that person accountable before Yahweh in the threshold blood covenant. You have a legal right and you have a moral obligation to do so because that other brother who may be doing wrong has an obligation to uphold that blood covenant. And if he doesn't, he's in danger. He's in serious danger. So let's read. He who believes as to entrust one's spiritual well-being in the Son has everlasting life and he who does not believe through willfully perverse disobedience of the Son, shall not see life. But the wrath with violent passion for punishment of Yahweh abides on him. He's in danger. So what Yahweh is saying is, your brother are in violation of this blood threshold covenant, and you are in danger of death. And I'm going to have all kinds of calamity coming upon your life so that it will correct you and bring you back to a place of spiritual sanity and sound-mindedness. And so we, as brothers and sisters in Messiah, have a moral obligation when we see somebody who is incorrect in the word to reestablish them back. And if you don't, then you will have the coals of fire 
on your head as well because this covenant compels both parties to conform. No matter which side of the fence you may be on, you have to conform. You have an obligation. This blood covenant threshold is a very, very serious matter. And I see many people who are playing with this in ways that's causing them all kinds of problems because they don't understand this concept. They don't understand that when they're doing things to their brother or sister and Messiah that's not right, they are paying consequences that they just not linked it up. And so it's our responsibility to help them understand why these things are happening to them in their lives. In verse 6, for we, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 8, carnal mindedness prevents, prevents the obedience that I'm, I'm talking about. So in verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, which is prosperity or shalom. It means prosperity, health and prosperity. Verse 7, because the carnal of the human natural mind is enmity and is oppositional hostility against Yahweh. The natural mind cannot and will not conform to the mandates of Scripture that we're being held accountable to. It can't do it. You can't do it on your own. You need the Ruach. You need the Spirit of Yahweh to be able to help you to free your mind from the bondage that it's in so you can understand these spiritual concepts and come out from the kind of strongholds that Hasatan has in our lives. For it is not subject to the law of Moses, of Yahweh, nor indeed can be. Nobody in the flesh can keep the law of Yahweh. It's impossible. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please by exciting to emotion Yahweh. See, this word please means not that he's just happy that you're doing the right thing, but the word here in the Greek actually means to excite his face into emotional pleasure. It draws a response on his face. That's what it's talking about in the Greek. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 13 through 24, we're look, going to look at spiritual bloodletting, uh, and this is continued. Um, in verse 15, whoever hates and detests to the point of persecution his brother is a murderer. So it's no longer just a matter of you take a knife and you kill somebody. It now comes with the tongue, with the mouth, which comes from the heart and from the mind. And so, to the point of persecution, his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And man, I'm telling you, with the internet now, with social media and stuff like that, I'm seeing people just at each other's throats, and they're murdering each other. Not having any fear whatsoever that Yahweh's judgment is upon them, because they are breaking the threshold covenant principle of not murdering their brother. And it's a lack of maturity. And that lack of maturity is a very, very dangerous thing and is getting people into a lot of trouble. And we need to start thinking a lot more deeply about our actions and how we think and how we feel. Okay, has no life abiding in him. Verse 16, but this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's a hard one. But one of the foundational principles of threshold blood covenant is that right now you guys are in here. If somebody came in here and said, I want Bob and I'm going to kill Bob, I have a moral obligation in threshold blood covenant is to stand between Bob and the person who's coming at him and lose my life for Bob. Pick up the execution stake and follow. Now, in the natural, I might like Bob. Bob is a nice guy, but in the natural, I don't want to lose my life for Bob. But we're not talking about in the natural. We're talking about threshold blood covenant. When we accepted Yeshua's blood, we accepted the threshold blood covenant, whether you understand it or not. And there are rules and regulations that govern your behavior and what you are mandated to do in given situations, just like the one I gave. I would have to stand between Bob and the other guy and take the bullet for him. Even though I know my wife is going to be a widow. That's not easy. That's not easy. 
But when you really start thinking about threshold blood covenant and what it, what it mandates as a believer, it really gets very serious. And too many people are just taking a lackadaisical attitude. Ah, praise Jesus for his blood. He forgives me of all my sins. And you go about your life never giving a second thought to what that blood covenant really means and what it compels you to do and not do. Let's move on. Uh, but whoever has this world's goods, which is a means of one's livelihood, and sees by discernment his brother in need, and that means whether of lack of employment, re requirements, or destitution, could be any of those particular categories, and shuts up his heart of inward affection of pity or sympathy from him, how does the love of Yahweh abide in him? It doesn't. It doesn't because Yahweh is defined as love. And the fulfillment of Torah is love. I've had times where I saw somebody in a situation like that. And I thought to myself, what do I do? And the first thought is to help. But then I think to myself, should I or shouldn't I? And there were times, sadly, when I did not help. And it bothered me later on that I shouldn't. I repented of it. I mean, it was the circumstance changed to the point where I couldn't go back and help. But I used it as a tool to help motivate me not to second guess the next time when I really feel that the spirit of Yahweh is telling me, you need to help this person in whatever way. And it actually came up not long after that. There was a single father who had uh, three children. The wife left him for another man, left him with the children. He was out of work. And uh, the children were like 10 or 11 and under. And um, he lived in this little ratty place with his kids. And I went over there one Sabbath after services, and I saw when he opened the refrigerator door, there was a, a gallon of water in there. That was it. There was no food. There was no milk. There was no eggs. No bait. There was nothing. And I looked at it, and I said, Larry, where's your food? Oh, well, uh, we, don't ha we don't have any food. Well, me and my wife, we looked at each other, said, stay here, we'll be back. We went out and we bought, this was back in the 80s, we bought, I think it was like $80 worth of groceries. Came back with meat and, you know, eggs and milk and, you know, all, all the basic stuff, stuff for the kids. And he came, we came back, the guy was in tears, he was crying. Because he didn't know how he was going to feed his kids. And, and it, was just, it was just a very gratifying, to see. and the thing is, not long after that, it actually happened to me as well. And somebody returned the favor. So don't withhold what you have as a blessing in your life that Yahweh's given to you to somebody else when you know in your heart of hearts they need the help. Because Yahweh's putting you in that circumstance to see what are you going to do. And if you don't do the right thing, he'll take you out of the picture and he'll deal with you off to the side and it isn't going to be very pleasant. And most of the time, people don't make the connection anyway that what they are suffering is because they made a bad decision. And so they just think it's coincidence. And it'll bring somebody else along to fill in the, the empty space and do for that person what you were supposed to do. That's how you demonstrate love. And I'm not just saying within the body of Messiah. I see people on the street. I help them in, in any way that I can. But there are times, sometimes, by helping somebody financially, where you're actually doing them an injustice. For example, an alcoholic. You know that when you give him that $5, he's going to go straight to the liquor store and he's got to buy more liquor. But maybe the smart thing to do is say, hey, brother, how about if I take you over here and I get you a hamburger or I get you something to eat, a chicken sandwich or something. If he declines, then you may want to walk away. Because if he wants some money, he's going to go buy more liquor. And that might be his last drink because maybe his liver says, that's it, I'm done. So it's a, you know we do got to use a little bit of wisdom on how we do these kind of things. So I'm not talking about those special circumstances. I'm just talking about how we need to behave towards one another and demonstrate this love through the concept of this threshold blood, uh, blood covenant uh, command. John, yes. I, I, I would like to interject for just if you're not sure to do it, and you say you have the rock in you, and you ask you sure, he'll give you the answer. He will give you the answer. He will give you the answer. And if you're not listening to the rock, you're grieving Yeshua himself. Exactly. So if you say you know Yeshua and you're not listening to him, 
you're grieving the spirit and you're grieving Yeshua. Right, exactly. And nobody has fear of this anymore, and that's the problem that I see. And I make these mistakes with the rock sometimes, and believe it, it is not nice to fear the Lord is my strength. And I do not have the rock when I'm praying to him, praying to our Father, it's death to me. And believe it, I walk every day now that careful because that consciousness, okay, not to have the rock hear me, and when I'm praying to the Father, and I don't feel the connection, that's death to me. Right. Let me, let me make a stipulation. There's a big difference between being put in that situation where you're trying to figure out what you should do, but you're not clear, and you still walk away, versus the concept of what he's talking about, shutting up your heart. Okay? There's a big difference between the two, because one is intentional, and the other one is not. The other one is through weakness or ignorance, sin through ignorance, okay? But what John is trying to get across here is where we shut down our heart completely, where you can't feel what the other person's going through. There's no empathy, there's no sympathy, there's no pity, there's no nothing. You've just got a cold heart. I'm not going to help. I don't really much care. Thank you very much. That's the thrust of what John is trying to get across here. It, once you're down that road, you're in really, really big trouble. Repentance is going to be a long, long road all the way back up if you even get to that point. Okay, so let's move on. Let us not love in word. Uh, let's move on. Sorry, my little children, and he refers to this in the Greek as my little darlings. Let us not have love in word, in tongue, but in deed, which is an act of labor. And in truth, in other words, you've got to do something. You can't just think it, you can't just feel it, but you need to actually do something. There's got to be a deed or an action that has to take place. In verse uh, 19, and by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure by pacifying our hearts before him. So what is this saying? What it's saying in essence is that when you do the right thing, you will not have a guilty conscience. You will not have, because he's going to pacify your heart, and that is a way of letting you know you did a good thing. You did the right thing. And if you can feel that in your heart of hearts, then that means you did the right thing. Even if you're not completely certain, this is what he's trying to get across. Verse 20, for if your heart of thoughts and feelings condemns as a note against us, in other words, you know in your heart you should be doing something and you refuse to do it because you shut your heart up, you know in your heart you're guilty. And that is, you're on notice, okay? So it's not like, well, I, I can say I didn't know. No, you know. You do know. Yahweh is greater than our heart and knows all things. In other words, he looks into the heart of man and he can see what's going on in your heart when you can't see it. He knows the evil intents of our hearts. So that's not an excuse. Don't think that somehow you can get away with it because he is the judge of our hearts and he knows the deep things of the hearts of man. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, about concealing of the heart. The spirit of man is the lamp of Yahweh, searching that which is masked and concealed. That which is masked. I'm going to tell a quick story. It wasn't really something I was thinking of, but it just hit me just now. Um, I was talking to um, Jose's wife last week, and we were talking about uh, things that happened in our youth. And that I was telling her that from the time I was seven years old, I have a complete lapse of memory. There's just darkness. There's no, I can remember things before, and I can remember when I turned eight years old. But the things in between, I could not understand. I was praying last week, and I'm like, all of a sudden it hit me. Like, I can't remember anything during this period. Now, I know from my own experience, something traumatic happened when I was seven years old that my mind shut down and it blacked it out. Okay? And I wanted resolution. And I said, I know something happened, and I wasn't quite sure what it was, but I knew it was traumatic in a negative contents. So what I did was I called my mother, and I said to my mother, I said, something bizarre has happened to me. And I explained it to her. She goes, well, I didn't really want to talk about that and didn't want uh, to mention anything about that, that period of your life. She said, because what happened is she got remarried, and I had a stepfather. And the stepfather had an anger problem, he had an alcohol problem, and, um, 
And the last thing I remember, because I did a little regression on myself, and I pinpointed the exact defining moment when everything went black. And what I remember was I was in the living room, and I remember he was, he was beating me. And he was, he was beating me in a very negative kind of way. And after that, everything went black. And I don't remember anything after that for that whole year. So I knew that that was the defining moment, that something in my spirit shut down and didn't, and I know I had other spankings and beatings and punishments and things, like, but I could not remember a thing. And so what happened was my mother said, I won't go into the long story about it, I don't have time, but what she said was that was a very low point in your life because I had taken you away from a very happy life with your grandfather and I moved you up here to New Jersey and I married this man and he was not a very nice man and you weren't happy about being there and he did beat on you a lot. So uh, there I go, I got my answer. I still don't know all the details of my life at seven years old, but at least I had resolution that I was able to understand what's going on. So these are things that are masked in our subconscious and they're concealed. And sometimes you just can't get access to those files to be able to replay them because there's strongholds and there's hurts and things that are going on in there that you can't do by yourself. But Yahweh knows. Yahweh knows what happened to you. And he knows how to heal you even if you can't access those particular areas of your life to get resolution. So let's move on. All the inner chambers and depths of his heart. And that really feels like an inner chamber and a depth inside of my heart that I just can't get access to. So I thought that was interesting. I find that a lot of times when I speak every week, I find that things that happen to me during the week are good metaphors for what I'm going to speak on, even though I don't know what I'm going to actually speak on yet, because I don't really come up here with any notes. Uh, Proverbs chapter 18, let's go to verse 19 now. A brother offended by breaking away from authority through quarreling or transgression is harder to win than a strong, secure city. And contentions that are brawling in nature are like the bars of a castle. And so what this is talking about is in this blood covenant scenario, we should not be quarreling. Does, does Yeshua quarrel with the Father? Absolutely not. He says, the Father and I are one. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. They don't quarrel amongst one another. They're ikad. They're completely joined together as one. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to create sons of Elohim, th that is us, and he's trying to make the image of Yeshua inside of us to the point where we don't quarrel and fight with one another anymore. Even though you might like vanilla ice cream, I like chocolate ice cream, I don't have the right to come to you and say, why are you eating vanilla ice cream? Chocolate is the more righteous ice cream to eat. That's nonsense. But there's a lot of stupid arguments that go on in the body Messiah like that that have no relevance to our actual calling whatsoever and no place for division. And so people, through their weakness of understanding, a lack of understanding of threshold blood covenant, allow the enemy to come in and take them captive. And they don't know how to be set free of that. You're looking at one. You're looking at a guy that when he came into the body Messiah, they called me the bulldozer. They called me the bulldozer because anybody that got in my way, I mowed right over top of them. You talk about a, somebody who didn't love this fellow brother in the way that he should have loved him, you're looking at him. You're looking at him. If you, man, if you weren't right down the middle with the way I was, I'd take out the spiritual two by four and I'd beat the living daylights out until you submitted. And you would submit or you were my worst enemy, one or the other. Now I'm talking about in the body of Messiah. But then Yahweh showed me over a period of time, that's not the way. That's not the way. I didn't do it to you, so don't do it to the others. You know, everybody needs their time to come to grips with things in their lives so they can make the kind of change. After all, it's Yeshua's work in that person. You don't have a right to kill that person with your words and destroy the image of Yahweh inside that person. You don't have the right to do that. And I can't take you to the next level because you won't bridle your tongue. And for many years, I couldn't go to the next level. I went to next levels on my own, but I couldn't go with Yahweh to the next level because I was abusive to many around me. And so now he's shown me that that's not the way. In many ways, I feel like Shaul going around persecuting the saints. 
you know, and drag them into all kinds of scenarios where I was killing them, you know, and I was. And I thought I was doing Yahweh service because I thought I was straightening them out. In the end, I needed a straightening out. It's funny, you know, many times we can be technically correct but spiritually wrong. So the things I was saying to them wasn't that I was wrong, but what was in my heart and the way I was venting it was wrong. And that, that was not ventilating love towards them. It was ventilating murder. Okay, so let's move on. Beloved, if your heart does not condemn as a note against us, we have confidence with all outspokenness and bluntness towards Yahweh. Verse 22. Um, I think I got a typo up there because I think we're back to John, 1 John. Sorry about that. I think I got a typo. Disregard it. And whatever we ask with craving, desire, or requirements, we receive from him because we keep to guard as a fortress from loss or injury his commandments. Today we're being told the commandments are done away with. See, they're trying to get rid of them for you. But what he's saying, John is saying is, you need to guard them as a fortress from loss or injury. Yeah, so his commandments are an authoritative prescription. The Torah is an authoritative prescription. It is a medication that heals the soul. But today we're being told it's done away. You don't need that anymore. But to do away with that is to do away with Yeshua because Yeshua is the Torah. Yeshua cannot detest, detest himself or de depart from the Torah any more than the Torah can depart from Yeshua. They're one and the same. Verse 22, and do these things that are pleasing as agreeable and excites the emotions in his sight and in his face. Verse 23, and this is the commandment, authoritative prescription that we should believe as to entrust one's spiritual well-being on the name. The name that has authoritative character of his son Yeshua HaMashiach and love one another as he gave us commandment which is the authoritative prescriptions. Verse 15 we're actually in Matthew 18 verse 15 through 35 more of your brother sins by missing the mark and not sharing the prize. Did you ever think about it that way? That when your brother falls and he doesn't want to repent He's not only missing the mark, but in that state, he's not going to share in the prize with you. Because if he's regressing and if he's pulling back and he's going backwards, he's falling away from the faith. Which means he's going closer and closer to the point of not sharing in the prize that the two of you have together in the blood threshold covenant. So it's your job to restore a fallen brother. You have a moral obligation to do that. By missing the mark and not sharing the prize against you, Go and tell him his fault with admonishment of rebuke between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear or give an audience to you, and I've had that happen, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word which is a command or a dispute may be established in the covenant stance. See, the blood threshold covenant has tenants in it or it has certain certain um, concepts built within it that when you go to talk to your brother it has to be based on those concepts of the blood covenant and he has to be in agreement that you're going to have this conversation based upon those concepts in blood covenant and if he doesn't then you've got a big problem because now you have got to escalate this to a higher level you need reinforcements and if he refuses to hear them Tell it to the church or the members of the called out ones. But if he refuses even to hear the church or the called out ones, let him be as a covenant stance to you like a heathen. So he's no longer part of the commonwealth of Israel. He's no longer an Israelite. He's no longer a believer in Yeshua and he's to be cast out. We don't do this today in the church and in the body of Messiah mostly. Mostly all this nonsense is, in, is, is uh, tolerated, and I would even say celebrated in many churches and messianic congregations. Man, I've watched people bring unclean spirits right into a fellowship and nobody even knows what's going on.
And they celebrate the person as if it's the Ruach that's working in them, but it's an unclean spirit. They don't even have the ability to even discern what is clean and unclean anymore. And yet we are given the Torah so that we will know how to discern the difference between the, that which is clean and unclean. Let's move on. To you, like a heathen, a Gentile, and a tax collector. Verse 18, Assuredly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose as to dissolve on earth, it will be loosed in heaven. The bottom line is that Yahweh has given us a threshold blood covenant, and together as community or one-on-one, -on -one, we can stand in authority in front of Yahweh's throne and proclaim as blood covenant brothers or sisters whatever it is we want to establish. Yahweh has to honor it. He has to bind it on earth and bind it in heaven because he's in that blood threshold covenant with us. He has a moral obligation to not lie because if he says if we come together in this blood covenant and we proclaim what we're going to proclaim and he backs out, then he's a liar. And he takes that seriously. He's not a liar. He's not a man that he should lie. And I don't think that we really tap into these principles in the way that we should or we could because I don't think we really quite understand it to the degree that we should but these are very serious covenant principles that he expects us I've talked about it before where he talks about Job how Job is laying on the ground he says to Job he says get up what are you doing laying down there in the dirt get up and stand like a man and proclaim a covenant to me I didn't I made you in my image according to my likeness not to be laying on the ground like a pathetic human being Stand up in faith and proclaim covenant. I want to hear it out of your mouth. I didn't make you to be a lame man li li uh, lying in the dust. And so a lot of times we have this woe is me mentality and there are things that we should be doing and we just don't do it because we're down and out on ourselves and we're beating ourselves up. Yahweh doesn't want to be us to beat ourselves up. When we're wrong, we acknowledge we're wrong, we come before the throne boldly and say, Abba, I screwed up, I messed up. Forgive me by the blood of Yeshua. Okay, it's done. Let's move on. But I see people just hanging their heads down and they're walking around dejected and they got low self-esteem and they don't have the faith. And Yahweh doesn't want that. That's why he told Job, get up. Declare a covenant to me. And so we've got to, um, we've got, we've got to increase our level of faith. Okay. What's that? Identity. Identity. We still don't really know who we really are. I spent all of last year and part of this year talking on our identity because it's a very important concept. Verse 19, again, I say to you that if two of you agree as to be harmonious by a compact, we're in agreement on this thing. Whatever it is you're in agreement with, you're in agreement and you're harmonious together on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. We really don't take them up on this. But part of this threshold blood covenant is, for example, I've had, you know, I remember many years ago when I met Anthony, he was in a predicament and he, he was asking me to pray for him and we had a pact. And I agreed with him in prayer and I think it was within a week, Yahweh gave him his answer. We've been buddies in uh, hombres ever since. And so it's not just, you know, where the two of you want to do something together, but when somebody is in need, when a brother's in need and it seems like there's no way out and there's no answer, but you believe that Yahweh can give the answer, you agree with that brother who's in that predicament and Yahweh will give you what you're asking for. He's obligated by blood covenant to do so. For where two or three are gathered as to be led together, I found that to be interesting. This concept of being together is a divine appointment. Because what Yahweh has done is he wants, to, he wants to manifest something in this natural realm. And what he does is he picks two or three people and he speaks to them by their Ruach because he wants this thing to happen. He knows that they will call him on this and he brings them by divine appointment together. So they're led together in his name that has authority and character and there I am in the midst of them. Then Peter came to him and said, Master... As a supreme authority, how often shall my brother sin that misses the mark to share in the prize against me? And I forgive him up to seven times. 
Yeshua said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven, which is 490. Which is interesting because in the prophecy in Daniel, basically we have the 490 year prophecy. So Yahweh has to forgive Israel for these 490 years of these transgressions. You know, here Yeshua is saying only, you know, you only got 490 times. This is 490 year prophecy. So, you know, we don't live that long, so it wouldn't apply to us, but it's the same basic concept. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle or compute the accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself how much is 10,000 talents? How much? 200,000 years of salary to repay. 200,000 years of salary in that day to repay. Now, let's say it was 100 years or 150 years, just for argument's sake. The point here is that what this guy owed as a measure of debt was so far beyond his capacity to repay it, he couldn't repay it. And that's what happens to us when Yahweh has called us out of the world. Our debt was so bad and so deep that we did not have the capacity to repay it. That's the metaphor that he's trying to get across in the text. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold, and this is interesting, as merchandise into slavery. With his wife and his children, all that he had, and that payment be made. Interesting that in the Torah it says that the man is worth more than the woman, and the woman is worth more than the child. So there's a value set in Torah over these three different entities, but you know, I'm not going to get into that today. Verse 26, the servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience, which is long-spirited uh, with me, and I will repay you all. The fact of the matter is, he didn't have the capacity to pay him. He didn't have 200,000 years worth of salary to be able to repay Yahweh, or the master in this case. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, in his bowels yearned with sympathy, released him, and forgave and set at liberty him of the debt. But as that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which is a co-slave, who owed with uh, accruing debt him a hundred denarii. A hundred denarii is only one-third of a year's salary. Big difference between these two guys and what they owed, isn't it? Huge difference. And he laid hands and seized with strength on him and took him by the throat to the point of wheezing and coughing. That's in the Greek. I mean, he was like choking the living daylights out of this co-slave. Okay? Saying, pay me what you owe me. I want it now. Give it to me now. I need it. But the fact of the matter is, when you look at what this guy had or what he owed, it wouldn't even be a drop in the bucket to what this guy owed the master that was actually forgiven him. So it doesn't make any logical sense why this guy went after this co-servant trying to squeeze money out of him and give him the shakedown. It doesn't make any sense. You know, it, it, when I was going through these texts, I was remembering that when I came into the faith, some of you know my testimony, I was on my deathbed and I was ready to die. I, I knew of Yahweh. Um, I wasn't following Yahweh. Quite frankly, I could care less about following Yahweh. I wanted to die. I just wanted to die. I was done with life. I didn't want to live anymore. I had a beautiful young new wife. I'd only been married uh, about a year and a half. And um, you would think that would have been enough to keep a young man uh, wanting to have passion to live. By this point, I was so beaten up, I just wanted to die. And I wasn't praying to Yahweh or anything. And then the next, this one day, I'll spare you the whole story, but this one morning when I woke up, he spoke to me, he said, today you're healed. Get up, go out, you can eat whatever you want. And that's what I did. And I never had the problem since. Two weeks later, he showed me about the Sabbath and I came to faith. Now, you would think that somebody who went through that would be somebody who would be thrilled to death and happy. But I wasn't. I really wasn't. And so what I did is I went and quarreled with everybody I could quarrel with, as I talked about before. And I fought with everybody who I could fought with. I should have been a guy 
that was thrilled to death that got a second chance at life. I should have been a guy that was thrilled to death that was brought to Yeshua and showed the Torah and showed who Yeshua and Yahweh is through this miracle, but I didn't. Instead, I became quarrelsome. I became an agitator. I became the bulldozer, like a Paul, so to speak. And so I had to go through a hard, lot of years of hard knocks in order to be able to learn that that was not the way. And so I did not have patience, like this man did not have patience with his co-servants. And I gave him the shakedown, just like this guy was given the shakedown. And he would not, but went and threw with violence him into prison till he should pay the debt. He had no mercy on his co-servants. I had no mercy on mine. I could not understand why you couldn't see what I was saying. What are you, dumb? Are you stupid? Are you an imbecile? Are you a moron? You cannot understand the simple words that I'm telling you about Messiah? <laughs> that was my philosophy. You know? Yeah. But in the end, I think they were probably much smarter than me because they didn't have my disposition. But Yahweh used it anyway. Praise and glory and honor belong to him. As the song says, he pulled me out of that nonsense and he helped me to see you don't need to be this angry young man that's at war with the whole world. Instead, he used the warring spirit to the war in a different kind of way. Anyway, let's move on. Um, and saw that he had done, so when his fellow servants or co slaves saw what he had done, they were very grieved and distressed with heaviness. Boy, people were distressed with heaviness when they saw me come around, especially when I was in a warring spirit, and came and told their master all that had been done. That, so now they're calling the reinforcements. And then his master, after he had called by invitation of him, said to him, you wicked and morally diseased degenerate from the original virtue, servant. See, this man was called to be a servant and he gave him the instructions on how to behave, on how to do things. I freed you everything. This blood threshold covenant freed this man. But he didn't get the concept, just like I didn't get the concept. And so he becomes morally diseased a degenerate from the original virtue of the faith that was handed to him. I don't think he ever captured the vision to begin with. He was the same miserable man after he was forgiven as he was before. I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not have also have given compassion, which is divine grace on your fellow servant, just as I had pity of the divine grace on you? And so this blood covenant requires that we see the frailties of our brothers and sisters and have pity and compassion and come to their aid, not try to destroy them. And I think this is the love that John is trying to get across. Because look, brothers and sisters, I, I know you all are looking out there at the TV and you're seeing this world is just coming apart. This world is becoming insanely dysfunctional. And I don't know how much time we got left. But the whole thrust of what John, as I was talking about from the very beginning in chapter 1, is about brothers are going to rise up against brothers. And they're going to betray you. And they're going to deliver you up to the council. Your heart is going to have to be in a position where you're operating from threshold blood covenant. Where you're not going to do to them what they're about to do to you. Right now we have relative peace. And if we can't lick this problem now, you're not going to be able to lick it when persecution really starts to happen. And so John is one chapter after another, one verse after another. He's just pounding this concept home about fulfilling the love of Yeshua by loving your brother as the commandment mandates. And this... And his master was angry, provoked and enraged with exasperation and delivered to prison of him to the torturers for pain and vexation until he should pay that which was due him. So now it became retroactive. Sounds like it's the IRS. <laughs> Sounds like the IRS because, man, when the IRS comes after you, they hit you with penalties and with interest. I think their penalties, correct me if I'm wrong, the penalty right up front is 
And that doesn't include the interest. It get, so this all became retroactive. So he got forgiven. And now Yahweh's saying, I'm wiping the slate clean. That which you owed me, now you got to pay it. Man, I don't want to be in that position. Man, I, I just want to take a gun at that point and just shoot myself and be done with it. Go straight to the lake of fire and get it over with. But this guy was a glutton for punishment. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother in his trespasses. We are compelled to forgive. Whether they accept or not, whether they reconcile or not, is beside the point. That is part of blood threshold covenant principle. We have to do it. And if we're not, we're trampling the blood of Yeshua under our feet. And we're making it of no effect. Back to 1 John chapter 3, verse 24, continuing. Now he who keeps to guard as a fortress from loss or injury his commandments, which are authoritative prescriptions, abides in a state of expectancy in a rest of him. There you go. So while the masses are telling you that the commandments are done away, this is John now. Probably Yeshua loved no other one of the disciples more so than John. This guy was the closest to Yeshua's heart. And when you read his text, it becomes easy to understand. Now, John has to know that if, you get, if he was to tell you to get rid of the commandments, to get rid of the Torah, that would separate you from Yahweh and separate you from his love. This is telling you that his commandments are authoritative prescription, and when it abides you, it abides in a state of expectancy as a rest. It's a rest. We are here on Shabbat because we are resting. We are freed from this world. We're freed from the obligations of this world and the strongholds out there that are constantly want to encroach into your life and choke the living daylights of the word right out of you and put so many demands on you that you can't possibly follow Messiah. But the Sabbath disciplines you week after week where you come in and you learn of his rest, his shalom peace. And you can't get that on any other day. It only comes on Shabbat, period. And that Shabbat rest then begins as a metaphor to show you what kind of rest you actually get in Yeshua because that is the natural leading into Messiah himself. So let's move on. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So in conclusion, in conclusion, my point here is, is that we need to start thinking a little bit more deeply about how we should love our brother and fulfill Torah when we do that. And not just brothers in the body of Messiah, but those people on the outside. Because who knows that the person out there that you don't really like very much all of a sudden, you wake up one day and he comes to you and says, I had a visitation from Messiah. And he's telling me to come talk to you about the covenant of Messiah. And this is like the last thing in the world you would think of ever having happened. And now you find yourself in a predicament because if you have this malice and lack of love and respect for this other human being, you're going to have to go through that wall of flesh to tear that thing and rip it out of your heart before you would even be qualified to mentor that person. Because if there's any ounce of malice inside of us, we will not be qualified to teach that person. What an awkward predicament that would be to have to be in that situation. And I've been in that kind of a situation before. And sometimes I think Yahweh uses stuff like that should show us more about what's inside of us than what you're actually supposed to be doing for the person. Not to negate it, because it's still a valid calling in whatever he's doing. But the fact of the matter is, we, if we're going to survive these end times, if we're going to live through these end times, if we're fortunate enough to live that long, if it, if it doesn't tarry, we are going to have to get this right. We are going to have to come back and understand what this blood threshold covenant really means and how our behavior should be governed in our re relationships with one another. But if we don't get that straight, we're in for trouble. And Yahweh will have to use somebody else because we would not be qualified. So let's be a committee of one to really, when we pray to Yahweh, 
Ask him with mercy and with compassion, show me where I lack in this area of my life. And help me to understand the dynamics of how this actually works so that when I do it, I'm consciously doing it with an understanding, not that I'm just groping in the dark and stumbling on this thing. I want to understand it with its precision so that at any moment, once I understand it, it's intrinsically with inside of myself, I know that I can use the same tool again and again and again and again over and over and over again before your throne of grace when I really need it and then I can become effective in my walk with Yeshua. So let's do that. Let's challenge Yahweh to reveal these spiritual truths of this threshold blood covenant to us so that we can come to a higher calling and effectiveness in Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen?